LAI and our members. It, it's certainly been a long time focus of LAI and our members uh, on how to promote development in Baltimore. Uh, and we're fortunate to have an academic in the city, particularly at our prestigious Johns Hopkins, uh, looking at that and looking at what's been done, not only in Baltimore, and, uh, but in other cities uh, and what can be done. Uh, and, and that person is Mac McComas, uh, who is the uh, senior program manager at Hopkins's uh, 20th Century Cities Initiative. And that's a research center focused on economic opportunity, inequality, and quality of life in cities. And he uh, received an MA in Scottish history from the University of Edinburgh and a Master's of Literature in Scottish Historical Studies from the University of St. Andrews. Uh, he's a co-author of various uh, books and uh, uh, fe featuring um, potential for uh, pot uh, unlocking the potential of post-industrial cities, which will be a primary uh, topic, as well as he's worked on a book uh, finding the uh, next Nash Nashville. And he's also been involved with uh, a study of investing in high-speed rail in the Baltimore, Washington area. So with that, uh, I bring on Mac McComas. Thank you. I'm uh, gonna share my screen here, so bear with me. All right, uh, can everybody see that okay? Great. Um, so thanks for the, for the introduction. Um, uh, so again, I'm, I'm going to talk today about um, a book uh, that I co-authored with Matthew E. Kahn, who is the Provost Professor of Economics at USC. Um, uh, came out earlier this year, and it's called Unlocking the Potential of Post-Industrial Cities. So in our book, we study the six post-industrial cities of Baltimore, Cleveland, Detroit, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, and St. Louis. Um, but really it, the book is about, um, is, is mostly focused on Baltimore. A lot of the examples are uh, drawn from Baltimore because um, you know, that's, that's where uh, we reside here at Hopkins. And um, that's, that's the main focus of a lot of the research that I do. Um, the book uh, takes the framework of urban economics and takes um, a lot of the lessons um, from uh, some of the most recent uh, urban economics research and uh, really focuses on a, on a quantitative analysis um, of these cities. Uh, we look over the last 50 years um, and, and, and think about some of the changes that they've experienced and, and some of the challenges that they've uh, faced. But, but really, um, you know, our, our book is optimistic. Um, we don't think that uh, any of these six cities are, are doomed to fail. Um, we, we recognize that cities are dynamic places that are constantly changing. Uh, if you think of cities such as Seattle and New York, um, they've witnessed periods of decline and periods of boom as they have reinvented themselves. And, and we think this is certainly possible uh, for the six cities that, that we look at. Um, and the, the main question that, that we focus on is how do these cities make a comeback? Um, so, so we, we focus on, on the challenges, um, uh, but again, uh, you know, we're not trying to be negative. We're not trying to, to um, uh, uh, bash on any of these cities, um, but, but some of the, the challenges they face are that, um, you know, despite uh, heavy investment in cities in, in the 60s and 70s, um, in, in subsequent decades, uh, federal and state government investments um, have, have really declined in cities. So, it, they can't rely on federal and state government to bail them out. Um, so with that in mind, they really need uh, homegrown solutions. Um, but part of that challenge is that cities operate under a budget constraint. Um, so there is sort of a, a fiscal challenge of, of deciding what to invest in. And when we think about investing um, uh, in, in the city's future, we look at four pillars of, of synergistic investment. So this is um, investing in people, investing in places, 
investing in business and investing in uh, government, good government. Um, you know, we, we do not think that there is any silver bullet for economic development. There's no one policy or, or intervention that will change the fate of a neighborhood or a city. And uh, a, a policy or an intervention that works in one city or one place might not necessarily work uh, in another. So unique context is, is important. What we, what we see is, is one of the challenges uh, that these cities face is, is what economists call the coordination failure. Um, where gainful investments uh, are not being made. So uh, a, a simple example of this would be um, uh, two property owners that own uh, uh, vacant housing that needs to be re redeveloped on the same block. And they are delaying uh, investment in, in rehabbing those buildings until uh, the block starts to turn around. Um, if they uh, both would invest, um, you know, this, this kind of uh, synergistic redevelopment would occur. But um, they don't. Neither of them want to be the first mover. Um, it's a it's a costly decision if they're wrong. So um, there's this kind of coordination problem uh, around investment that that's happening in all four uh, of these areas. So uh, I'm going to kind of go through uh, some of the the, the focuses um, uh, that, that we look at in our book. Uh, and the first is um, investing in people, and, and in particular, uh, educating uh, young people. The Nobel laureate economist James Heckman has shown that every dollar invested in high quality early childhood education returns over $7 to the economy. Um, so simply put, investing in early childhood education is a really good investment. But, but again, the question becomes, um, you know, what is uh, a good investment? Um, in recent years, Baltimore uh, has expanded its offering of, of pre-K in high need neighborhoods, and they've seen promising results. Um, uh, the, the city and the state are, are investing in education. Uh, the Kerwin Commission uh, is eventually going to cost the city $330 million by 2030. Um, it's, it's an imperative investment. But the question is, how does the city pay for that? Um, we look at things like uh, 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 infrastructure as is, is a, is a challenge. So only 17% of the city's schools are in good condition, which is uh, some of the lowest number in the state. Um, school closures due to HVAC or, or other um, kind of poor school conditions during the last five school years in Baltimore have resulted in $1.5 million, uh, sorry, 1.5 million hours of lost education and learning. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, again, thinking about some, some positives here is that the, the city has recognized this and, and started to invest in school infrastructure through the 21st Century Schools Program and, and see new schools um, coming up. Uh, throughout the city. I said I would go downtown, but I'm thinking that I'll try to make it virtual. Um, so, so again, um, uh, we're not just interested in, in education of young people, but uh, the education of, of older people and, and skills of um, uh, middle-aged folks. And, and this has been a particular challenge, um, not just in Baltimore, um, but in, in many post-industrial cities where manufacturing jobs uh, have gone and, and kind of what remains is, is um, low pay service jobs. Um, real wages of, of less educated workers have fallen in the United States from 1980s to present. And this is exacerbated income inequality. The economist David Autor has shown that the nature of work uh, has, has changed more for workers who are less educated than those who are more educated. So there again becomes this challenge of, of um, building up skills. Um, another challenge is that high school graduates don't earn a wage premium. They live in a high skill city. So, uh, you know, if you think about um, uh, a high school person living in a, in a low cost area, they don't necessarily earn more if they move to a, a high cost uh, city. Um, so as, as high school, high paying jobs increase, uh, so do rents and, and services in these cities, but uh, less skilled workers aren't, um, aren't benefiting from this necessarily. So we have to think about, about how to raise um, uh, the skills and the, and the quality of work uh, for less educated folks. Um, another challenge is that over the last three recessions that occurred in the past 30 years, job losses have been associated with a rise in automation. Um, this means that firms in an industry are choosing times of decline uh, to substitute capital such as robots um, uh, or software automated processes for less skilled workers. Um, there's also been this kind of hollowing out of um, kind of middle-class, uh, middle-skill jobs. So 
Uh, there's a group called the Economy League of, of Greater Philadelphia. And in 2017, uh, they partnered with the city of Philadelphia to try to do um, a kind of workforce development strategy and analysis. And they were trying to go in and identify kind of middle skill, middle class jobs that were growing in the city. And they weren't simply put, they weren't able to find it. Um, so instead, what they did was they uh, identified uh, relatively um, high salary occupations uh, for, for low skill jobs that had career development pathways. And these are jobs such as general office clerks or customer service representatives. Uh, and their goal was to try to identify and, and kind of target workforce development strategies around these jobs. Um, uh, briefly, I want to mention uh, this photo on the right, which is of um, a group called Lazarus Wright in Baltimore. Um, the, the person who runs that group on the far left, uh, Chris Irvin, um, he has created this program uh, that uh, provides commercial driver's license training and certification for returning citizens uh, so that they can work as uh, truck drivers. Um, this is obviously a, a, a job that is in very high demand right now and, and salaries can earn $60,000 a year. Um, so again, you have to think about um, uh, what are some of the career pathways for, for folks such as uh, returning citizens. Um, again, thinking about investing in people, uh, one, of the, one of the challenges that, that all of these cities face, but especially uh, Baltimore, is uh, persistently high levels of violent crime. Um, uh, again, uh, you know, there's, there's been a lot of um, uh, high profile news stories about uh, the challenges in the Baltimore Police Department. Um, but at the same time, there, there are a lot of uh, new uh, promising programs that are uh, being tested in the city. Um, uh, ROCA, Safe Streets, and, and now um, the Mayor's Group Violence Reduction Strategy. Um, but all these uh, programs are, are really in their early days and, and they haven't been um, uh, uh, kind of scaled up uh, to the point where they can be rig rigorously evaluated. Um, so what we, what we emphasize is that um, you need a scientific approach to determine uh, if these programs are cost effective and if they have community support and, and backing. And again, a lot of these programs have shown promise in, in other cities, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, there's been a lot of research on uh, programs in Chicago that, that have been effective. But the question is, can you replicate and scale a program that works in one city uh, uh, in another? Um, next, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, uh, investing in businesses. So this chart shows uh, total employment in Baltimore, which is the blue line, uh, and in the U.S. in the orange line since 1969. And you can see there's, there's quite steady growth in the U.S., and quite uh, you know, steady decline in, in Baltimore, although uh, a positive trend in recent years. Um, again, the city's lost uh, a huge amount of, of manufacturing jobs. Um, uh, and, and again, while there has been a positive trend uh, in the last decade, uh, a lot of that has been very dependent on big businesses. Um, so, you know, there's this old adage that um, uh, small businesses uh, drive job growth. Uh, and while that's true nationally, um, that's not true uh, in the US, unfortunately. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about access to capital, uh, particularly for black owned businesses. Baltimore City has one of the highest share of black owned businesses uh, of any city in the US. Um, however, uh, while almost 50% of businesses in Baltimore are black owned, um, black owned businesses make up only 10% of employer firms in the city, and they have less than 4% of the total revenue of all employer firms and just 6% of the employees. Um, this is a, a, a particular challenge um, uh, that, that Baltimore faces. Um, and uh, we think a, a, a big part of this is um, challenges in, in access to capital. So uh, the economists Alicia Robb and, and Robert Fairley have studied racial disparities in access to capital. And they found that even after controlling for credit scores, black owned businesses are less likely to obtain uh, the capital that they need, suggesting significant racial bias among lenders. They've also found that black business owners were three times more likely to report fear of loan application rejection than their white counterparts. Um, but again, thinking about promising models, uh, there, there's a group uh, in Baltimore called Baltimore uh, Business Lending that's um, now a part of uh, Baltimore Community Lending. 
and it's a community development financial institution or CDFI that makes uh, loans to businesses that don't have collateral, but they have a sound business model. And the, the image on the right here is of, of, of a business uh, and the owner of that business. Um, and the business is called Off the Rocks and it's a black owned wine shop that um, was uh, being opened up in an upcoming neighborhood in, in Baltimore. Um, but they needed a micro line, to, micro loan uh, to buy a refrigeration unit. Um, but they didn't have any collateral, so they couldn't uh, go to a, a traditional bank to get a uh, business loan, but they had a, an excellent business model. So Baltimore Business Lending gave them this loan. Uh, they opened up the shop. It's been a huge success, and, and they repaid their loan early. Um, so I think this really highlights uh, a lot of the potential um, that are in some of these businesses in the city. And if we can find uh, creative ways to finance these businesses, um, then, then there are significant gains there. So looking at, at, at kind of different types of businesses, um, uh, we spend a bit of time in the book talking about um, uh, startups and, and venture capital um, in Baltimore and these other cities. And, and in one of the six cities that we look at, uh, Pittsburgh um, has had particularly particular success um, uh, around its robotics uh, industry and, and startups um, coming out of, of Carnegie Mellon. Um, Baltimore similarly has had uh, early success around Johns Hopkins and University of Maryland startups and uh, kind of nascent biotechnology cluster. Um, but again, there's, there's a, a challenge here around creating uh, kind of a, a good and, and strong ecosystem. And, and some of the research that I've done has shown that um, uh, while there are a lot of businesses uh, starting up, a lot of biotechs uh, startups coming out of the city, um, unfortunately, when, when some of them reach a certain uh, growth stage, they leave for Boston or for California um, uh, because they, they kind of lack some of these uh, strong um, uh, pieces of, uh, of an ecosystem. Um, a, an example of, of kind of this coordination failure for, for biotech companies is uh, when they reach a certain growth stage, they need to quickly expand and, and um, get wet lab space. But the city barely has any openings for this. So these businesses kind of end up uh, leaving the city. So again, there's, there's a, a, a potential here that's, that's unrealized. Um, thinking about now uh, investing in, in places, um, this is a, a photo of the American Brewery Building um, in, in East Baltimore, uh, which is now the headquarters of Humanum. And uh, you know, it used to be kind of the center of, of, um, of brewing kind of old manufacturing jobs. Then it, um, when those jobs left, uh, the building declined and it, and it was vacant for many years. Um, but uh, this organization, Manon, came in and, and used new markets tax credits to redevelop it. Um, so again, I think this is a great example of, of the potential of, of breathing life into new buildings. Um, you know, you think about Harbor East, uh, it's, it's kind of, uh, the shining example of redevelopment in the city right now, but you know it used to be the site of an old chromium factory. Um, so again, thinking about uh, uh, where some of these opportunities exist in the city, um, we we sponsored some research on um, uh, opportunity zones, which are uh, obviously a, a hot topic in um, real estate these days. Um, there's been questions about. Uh, how useful they can be to drive investment in distressed neighborhoods. Um, but unfortunately, uh, uh, some of the, the, the research that, that we sponsored has shown that um, a lot of those um, opportunity zone investments haven't really held up against um, kind of the, the but for analysis. Um, so there becomes this question of um, how do you drive uh, development in, into areas that um, wouldn't experience it otherwise. Um, it, I'm going to briefly highlight uh, a report that I put out earlier this year that looked at um, creating a express mark train service between Baltimore and, and uh, DC. Um, there, the economist Ed Glazer uh, talked with him a little while ago, and, and he summed up 50 years of economic research on transit as bus good, train bad. Um, but even he uh, uh, is... is um, uh, looks positively on um, uh, the, the impact that faster rail transit service could have between these two cities. Um, but currently it's, it's, it's uh, underutilized. There are only about 3,000 people uh, who live in Baltimore and, and work in DC. 
Um, yet there are over 300,000 jobs within two miles of Union Station. Um, if, if we unlock that job market from Baltimore City, that would effectively uh, double the city's job market. Um, Again, these jobs are much higher paying on average uh, in, in DC and Baltimore, um, while it's, it's much uh, cheaper uh, to live in Baltimore. So there's, there's again, this, this kind of um, lack of coordination where um, uh, some gains could be had, uh, realized here. Um, and, and in particular, we look at the, in, in this report, we look at the West Baltimore Mark Station, um, uh, where there are over a thousand uh, vacant buildings within a half mile of it. And, um, you know, there is some redevelopment going on in that area, but um, uh, kind of the, the um, potential that we look at is if there was this faster uh, train service, uh, could this uh, be, could that kind of unlock the potential of this area for uh, more significant redevelopment? Um, one of the things that, that we highlight and one of the focuses of, of my co-author, Matt Kahn, who is a uh, urban economist who really focuses on environmental issues uh, is the rising demand for, for green cities um, with green amenities like uh, waterfronts and, and parks as, as major assets. Um, there's been major environmental progress in air pollution reduction, clean water reductions in lead poisoning uh, in, in recent decades, um, but still there's, there's a lot of progress to be made. There's been uh, research on uh, the, the connection between childhood lead poisoning and, and violent crime um, and air pollution and, and economic mobility and education. Um, so we, we need to keep on pushing this progress. Um, thinking about uh, some, some bright sides here, Baltimore is, is one of the few cities that has expanded its tree canopy over the last decade. Uh, many others are, are shrinking. Um, but the city still faces uh, uh, kind of new challenges with urban heat island effect. Um, and, and flash flooding that's, that's only going to likely to increase. Um, uh, one, of the, one of the bright examples that, that we look at is um, a program in Philadelphia called Green City Clean Waters, um, where the city uh, in, in the last 10 years invested in green stormwater infrastructure through a kind of distributed system um, uh, around the city to uh, reduce some of the risk of, of flash flooding. Um, but again, there's, there's a challenge here of kind of this known unknown risk of climate change, uh, uh, of identifying the most vulnerable areas of the city uh, that, are, that are prone to things like flooding and, and urban heat island, uh, and thinking about um, cost-effective adaptation, adaptation measures that can be utilized. Um, then one of, the, one of the things that we end on in our book is thinking about investing in, in, in government kind of um, uh, urban governance challenges. Um, you know, Baltimore has, has certainly had a lot of challenges around, um, uh, you know, uh, local government accountability in recent years um, uh, and, and, and kind of lack in trust. So um, the question becomes, how do, you, how do you kind of rebuild some of that trust in government um, and how do cities uh, effectively um, collaborate and engage um, uh, a variety of stakeholders. Um, again, we, we see this, this problem of uh, policy ex experimentation and, and figuring out uh, what policies work and, and do not work. Um, there's also uh, issues of, of again, I, I, I highlighted um, you know, the example of cognitive behavior therapy programs working in Chicago. Um, the question is, uh, uh, you know, does what works in one city, is that going to work in another city? So you have um, you know, this kind of rise in, in peer learning networks uh, with groups like What Works Cities and 100 Resilient Cities. Uh, my colleague at, at Hopkins, Beth Blauer, uh, runs a group called the Center for Government Excellence. Uh, they focus on kind of upskilling um, uh, resident, uh, sorry, uh, staff in cities, um, teaching them, uh, uh, you know, how to use technology um, on the job. Uh, and, and, and so, Again, we're, we're, we're positive. We were writing this book. Um, we started writing the book uh, before COVID. Um, as we were just about to end the book, uh, COVID happened. And you know, there was this discussion about um, uh, what does uh, kind of the post-COVID world, um, this kind of rise in, in telecommuting and the new work from home economy, what does that mean for cities? Um, 
and, and, and we're, we're positive on, on uh, some of the potential for, for some of these cities. You know, what you've seen is, is uh, companies like Facebook uh, decentralizing and um, they've uh, in the past year uh, and a half opened up um, uh, decentralized offices in, in Pittsburgh and in Philadelphia and some of these low, lower cost cities. And, and so I think a, a city like Baltimore could uh, stand to gain from, from some of that. Um, again, you know, there's, there's a, uh, still a, a large demand for young people to live in cities. Um, uh, you know, everybody's, I think, aware of, of Baltimore's population decline in, in the recent years, but one of the uh, kind of bright sides of that is that um, we've seen massive growth in the immigrant population. So again, the question becomes, how does, how does Baltimore kind of uh, foster that and um, encourage that? And, and so one of the things I want to end on today is uh, my book cover, which um, uh, this is the, the Old Town Mall. Um, which is a, is a good segue to uh, your, your talk next month with uh, Dan Henson. Um, and uh, why I chose this photo is because I think it's um, uh, kind of, uh, it, it highlights the challenge of a, of a tale of two cities. Um, and so you have the old town mall, uh, but, but kind of peering through, uh, you look onto the, the tall buildings of, of downtown Baltimore and the Inner Harbor. Um, and what, what, we, what we discuss in our, our uh, concluding chapter is um, a paper that was written by the Nobel laureate economist Paul Krugman, um, who's, who's more famous today as a New York Times call, columnist. But uh, a couple decades ago, he wrote a paper um, looking at history and expectations in investment decision making. And essentially, what he was saying was that um, when people, when businesses make investment decisions, they are both weighing the history uh, of an area or of an experience um, against future expectations of what uh, might happen in a place. So, you know, again, if, if you're looking at um, uh, a place like the Old Town Mall, you might see, um, you know, a, a rundown place with, with shuttered businesses uh, that, that doesn't have a great future. But, you know, if you heard that Dan Henson is coming in and, and going to do something in this area, uh, that might change your, your decision making, that, that uh, suddenly there, there might be a brighter future. Here. Um, you know, Old Town Mall, again, is, as we briefly talked about, was, was once a, a model of, of urban development. Um, but then it, it fell victim to depopulation, rising poverty rates in, in the drug uh, trade, leading to the site um, to, to decline. Um, but again, you're, you're looking down through uh, into Baltimore's downtown, which is uh, now um, facing its own challenges as uh, businesses are, are relocating to Harbor East. So, um, you know, what I really want to kind of end on here is um, what I started on, which is that, that cities and neighborhoods are, are dynamic places that go through boom and bust cycles. Again, you think about Seattle and New York City. So the, the imperative and ultimate question becomes, uh, how do cities uh, reinvent themselves? And I'll uh, end on that and uh, open it up to questions. Okay, th th thank you, Mac. Uh, yeah, please put your questions in the chat and uh, we'll start off though. I've got a number of questions for you. Uh, one is about a year ago, we had a presentation uh, by Steve Walters, uh, who was, uh, had been associated with Hopkins as, as well. And his thesis was that if you just cut the tax rate, that that's the best way to reinvigorate a city. And he pointed to uh, San Francisco and Boston as using that strategy. Can, can you uh, respond to that? And what, what's your view of, of that kind of approach? Yeah, so, so I think he, he obviously makes a, a good point that um, Baltimore City's um, high tax rate uh, presents a, a challenge for any um, kind of uh, development um, decision-making. Um, but, but again, I, I think, um, you know, going back to, to what I was saying earlier in uh, my presentation is that uh, we don't really think there's any kind of one policy or, or one intervention that will, will change the city's future. I think, um, you know, you, you need to think about um, things like, uh, uh, you know, 
basic service delivery um, for, for local governments for uh, keeping streets clean and, and uh, crime reduction. So um, while I think that it is uh, certainly a good idea and, and something that the city should test out, um, uh, you know, I, I'm not I'm not too certain that it would be kind of again the the silver bullet for um, turning around the fate of Baltimore. Okay. Uh, can can you uh, describe what uh, is being done in Nashville? I know you've done a report on that. Yeah, so so uh, I've been doing a, a series of reports um, on Nashville that that really looks into um, some of the lessons uh, that can be gained from uh, looking at at Nashville's uh, growth in, in recent decades. And what we focus on there are um, kind of quality of life issues in cities, um, things like um, uh, yeah. job sector diversity. Um, and, and good local governments. And, and so, again, thinking about um, uh, what Nashville had going right for itself, uh, those are some of the, the elements that we explore in that series. Okay. Um, if Baltimore has had uh, several large TIFs, uh, particularly EBDI and Harbor Point and now Port Covington and um, Yes, they've also approved Perkins Homes and and uh, Old Town. Uh, can you comment on uh, what your feeling is as to how successful those have been in uh, helping the city? Um, yeah, so so I haven't uh, myself done a, a any uh, in depth research on those, but I but I would say. Um, that uh, thinking about um, uh, a development like like Port Covington, um, one of the challenges becomes if if the city puts uh, a lot of time and investment into one area and it doesn't kind of pan out uh, as planned. So uh, again, thinking about um, you know the the kind of headquarters for Under Armour has, has been uh, downsized um, in, in subsequent years since that uh, since the TIF was announced. They were initially planning it for, for it to be kind of um, a cybersecurity hub. Um, it, it seems that, that some of those um, plans have uh, not panned out. Now it's kind of being um, uh, marketed as a, a biotech uh, office space. So again, I, I think the challenge is if, if the city puts kind of all of their eggs in one basket and um, it, it doesn't turn out as planned. Um, I think that's, uh, that, that can be a risky strategy. How does the lack of political integration between Baltimore City and Baltimore County play in Baltimore City's challenges? Yeah, so that's um, uh, definitely a, a good question. And um, uh, again, brings us back to, to one of these things that, that I mentioned, which is the uh, issue of coordination failure. Um, going back to, to my report on Nashville, uh, what, what uh, one of the things that Nashville did um, a couple decades ago, and I think it was in the, the 1970s was it um, integrated with its uh, suburbs um, because it was uh, facing a challenge of um, providing sewer and water services to its, its growing suburbs. Um, so, it, so it definitely um, uh, plays a challenge and you see that in things like sewer and water infrastructure, but also in things like um, transportation services. I mean, Baltimore doesn't uh, really have a, a a regional transportation uh, service like uh, a lot of other cities around the US does. Uh, this uh, person uh, says that most of the other cities you study seem to be doing better, growing population, et cetera. Uh, you know, so what should Baltimore prioritize? Yeah, so, so um, you know, definitely. So we, so we look at Baltimore, Cleveland, Detroit, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, St. Louis, and I, I you know, say that that uh, Philadelphia and Pittsburgh are, are certainly um, uh, doing better than uh, some of the other cities that, that we look at. And, um, you know, some of their success has been in uh, particularly strong job growth um, in, in recent uh, decades. So a lot of the research that I do in Baltimore um, is on kind of uh, creating a good entrepreneurial ecosystem. So 
Um, if I had to, to kind of pick one thing that, that Baltimore City should prioritize, uh, I, I would um, look at kind of um, improving the city's entrepreneurial environment and, and kind of uh, focusing on, on job growth. And can you elaborate on your comments regarding opportunity zones? Sure. So um, we, uh, we sponsored um, some uh, research uh, by a Hopkins a colleague of mine who did um, a qualitative study of opportunity zones in Baltimore. And so what he did was he went around and he interviewed um, a variety of, of people involved in uh, opportunity zones, either kind of institutional people in the city who work um, on the program or investors. And um, essentially what, what he found is that the uh, investments that were being made um, in uh, the city's opportunity zones were either investments that uh, were kind of in the pipeline already um, and, and would have um, uh, moved forward with that without opportunity zones or were investments um, that uh, didn't benefit um, uh, some of the low income neighborhoods uh, where they were uh, taking place. Uh, you, you had talked about big data. Uh, can you go into that a little more about what what can be gleaned from that and, and what the risks are there? Sure. So, um, you know, Baltimore is, is uh, actually uh, pretty good in this, in this respect. Um, uh, the city has a, a website called Open Baltimore where it posts um, uh, a variety of, of open data that anybody can go online and, and kind of uh, download. But um, more broadly, you know, cities have uh, access to um, uh, a wide range of, of administrative data sets um, uh, that they can use to evaluate um, their, their policies and, and programs, but um, they, they kind of don't uh, uh, use a lot of that, um, both because of a lack of capacity and a lack of, of training of, of staff. Um, but there is a huge potential there um, where if uh, city staff do know how to uh, use some of the, the data that they collect, that they can do uh, kind of better um, policy interventions, they can uh, better target programs, um, and uh, ultimately lead to, to better outcomes. But, uh, what about privacy risk? That, that is, is certainly um, uh, a major concern, and uh, the risk could be that um, uh, you know, if, if residents, especially low-income residents, see, uh, uh, you know, kind of big government coming in and, and collecting more data on them, uh, this could increase hesitancy to kind of interact with um, uh, city government um, because of, of those kind of both fears of privacy and kind of the, the you know, big brother state. Yeah. Uh, one, of, one of the current hot strategies for Main Street revitalization has been recruiting uh, micro manufacturing for vacant retail structures with retail outlets still associated. Uh, have you looked at this in your case studies? So I have, I have not um, looked at that in particular, but I, I have kind of noticed um, that trend, uh, especially in, in Baltimore. Um, and again, I think it's a it's an excellent example of um, of cities kind of uh, reinventing um, uh, vacant commercial space. And I, you know, I've, I've seen this through a lot of you know, there's a lot of kind of uh, clothing retailers um, uh, that have been doing this uh, around the city. And I think uh, it's it certainly seems like a promising strategy, um, and uh, kind of I think for for a city like Baltimore. Um, is interesting because it, it kind of melds the city's uh, manufacturing um, uh, legacy with kind of the, the arts and, and culture scene that I think the city is, is fairly well known for. So I think, I think there's a, a really great potential there. Uh, you've recognized how greening and green trails can increase the uh, tax base value of surrounding properties. Uh, you you wanna comment on that further? Sure. Yeah. So, so um, uh, I'm a little bit involved in a, a, a program 
um, that's uh, going on in the city called the, the Greenway Trails Network. Um, and this is a plan to connect uh, the city's existing parks um, through uh, uh, pedestrian and bike paths um, uh, to increase kind of access to, to green space. Um, yeah, and we've had a couple of programs on that. Oh, great, great. Um, but I think it, it, it speaks to, um, you know, kind of the demand for, for accessing parks and, and green space in cities. And you certainly saw that uh, during COVID with, um, you know, people uh, going out in parks and, and, you know, demand for green space kind of exploded. Uh, what do you think about, uh, should, should there be a focus of TOD and transit projects that have a job-centric focus in getting residents to existing uh, job areas in the city, particularly in downtown, uh, the downtown CB CBD? Yeah, definitely. And, and um, that is, is something that um, I talk a little bit about in uh, my report on the uh, Express Mark train, and I think you know if you look around um, Penn Station, that that area obviously has a, a huge potential for redevelopment, and uh, you know we've seen some some vacant lots be turned um, and, and upzoned into uh, higher density apartment buildings, and that um, you know the fact that that project is is moving forward, I think is um, uh, is really great to see. And a number of post-industrial cities have seen revitalizations of neighborhoods as a result of new immigrant populations. Uh, you seen the effect of, of that in the cities you studied? Yes, yes, certainly. Um, uh, Detroit uh, in particular has done a, a, a very good job of uh, attracting um, uh, some immigrant groups um, in the last couple of decades. And, and uh, I've talked to um, some folks working on those issues uh, in Detroit. Um, you know, in Baltimore, uh, again, thinking about um, one of the, the only um, uh, population subgroups that is, has grown in the last 10 years has been the, the Hispanic and um, Latin population. And, and most of that has kind of been in um, uh, Southeast Baltimore around uh, Highland Town and, and Greektown. Okay. Um, okay, I think we've come to the end. Uh, we thank you for a wonderful presentation, Mac. I think we all learned a lot. And uh, we hope to see all, all of you back for our annual meeting. Uh, and uh, uh, on December 8th, uh, where we will have Dan Henson as our speaker. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Mac. <clears throat>